their voices, both individually and as co-authors, have made a tremendous difference to public debate uh, in our time on economic matters. Uh, they've driven a great deal of nonsense from the stage, uh, and they have both uh, been clear voices for sensible policies that help people. Uh, in fact, many of us sleep better at night knowing that whatever plutocratic uh, foolishness the Washington Post may have written overnight, uh, Dean will be up at 4 a.m. Uh, <laughs> in the Barbara sphere, and by 9 a.m. or so, Jared will be doing the same uh, on TV. Uh, and quite frankly, we couldn't have picked a better day to host uh, Dean and Jared discussing their book, Getting Back to Full Employment. Because yesterday, the, the Senate finally reached and passed a deal uh, extending unemployment benefits for the long-term unemployed by another year. Uh, we had to have this fight because the reality is that seven years after the first signs of economic crisis in 2007, America has the long-term unemployment rate of a country stuck in deep recession. Uh, the truth is we are very, very far indeed from full employment. Uh, the most visible consequences of mass unemployment uh, is the suffering of the unemployed, of people who want to work, who need to work, and simply can't find work. Young people uh, who, with every passing day, become less employable, people in midlife with families to support, and those nearing the end of their careers who fear that they may never find work again. Uh, but the point of Dean and Jared's book is that mass unemployment hurts everybody, employed and unemployed alike, and full employment is good for everybody. Now, mass unemployment drives down everyone's wages and contributes to a downward spiral of demand that impoverishes customers and saps our economic strength. Working people understand this, and it's at the heart of our <coughs> culture of solidarity. We either fall together uh, or we rise together. And the AFL-CIO is committed to the fight to raise wages, and that means raising the federal minimum wage, it means passing state and local living wage statutes, and it means demanding employers like Walmart stop driving down wages and start to, to lift them up. But our work, quite frankly, would be so much harder. Uh, and will be so much harder as long as we have mass unemployment. Full employment is the key to raising wages and to restoring the virtuous cycle of a rising income, economic growth, and investment that give us, that gave us this past century, the American century. But quite frankly, you never know this from much of what passes for economic debate in Washington. Instead, you think that what really matters is the daily ups and the daily downs uh, of the stock market. And that's why getting back to full employment is such an important book. And Dean and Jared uh, are such valuable, valuable voices uh, in our country today. So please welcome them to the AFL-CIO. And after they finish speaking, uh, they'll take some questions. Please join me in welcoming Jared. Thanks, Rich. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. You know, we've, uh, you know, one of the things I really appreciate since I've been in Washington, which is now over 20 years, has been the opportunity to work with the FLCA, you know, work with the union movement, because, you know, it's one thing to be out there blabbing and, you know, hopefully make some sense, but it's not had any impact unless you have people behind it, people care about, people have some influence, and certainly we appreciate the opportunity to work with the labor movement, and certainly with Rich and, and his years here. So uh, I appreciate that. I'm very impressed that he came down from Montana to be here with us. <laughs> so we're going to divide up uh, the chores here. What I wanted to do was to start out talking a little bit about the trade deficit and also the target unemployment rate. We'll talk about 4%. I'll come back to that in a second. And there, Jared's going to pick up and make the arguments about, and go over the evidence about how full employment, how low unemployment is necessary in order to have broadly shared wage gains. So just my first two points that I wanted to make 
Um, one is this town is absolutely obsessed with budget deficits. And when we want to argue what we argue in the book is that's really the wrong deficit. We should be talking about the trade deficit that's really front and center in the economic picture. In fact, even in the budget deficit. So if you want to get the budget deficit down, you're really serious about that, you should be talking about the trade deficit. We want to say that's actually a matter of policy. We can influence it. We should be talking about that. The second point is, again, the target what we should be shooting for. We picked 4% in this book. Yeah, some people have jumped on me. Jared's probably done the same thing in his emails. Oh, why are you stopping at 4%? Why can't we do better? Maybe we can. But we got enough economists mad at us saying 4%. So I want to make that argument as to why we think that's a reasonable target. And, and I was sort of starting to get called Jared and I got involved in this argument. We were surprised. You actually have people saying already that the unemployment rate is so low that the Fed should be talking about raising interest rates to try and slow the economy. It's sort of a scary story. Um, it's scary anyone would say that, but these are people that are not right-wing coups. I mean, you expect anything from the heritage people, these aren't heritage people. I mean, they should be, but... Um, okay, to start out, the, the, the basic story that, you know, talking about the trade deficit, I'm a big fan of, of national income accounting. I won't bore you with an intro macro course, but I just want to make, you know, a fairly simple point. This is something that, you know, certainly that people write on economics should know, and many don't. But I'm saying people write on economics, and like reporters from the New York Times, Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal. Net of national income accounting, there's four places demand comes from. Either it comes from consumption, comes from investment, comes from government spending, or it comes from the foreign sector, net exports. That's net. Exports minus imports. We export stuff and bring it back to the country that's trying to create jobs. Net exports. All right, well, if you look at that, you go, okay, we're about five percentage points below full employment in terms of potential GDP as a congressional budget office estimates this. So this is Jared and I. You know, my number is about full employment. This is what the Congressional Budget Office say that we're about five percentage points below. Turns that into roughly eight hundred billion a year in lost output. That's where we where we sit. Okay. So the question is, how do you make up that gap? And if you listen to, to the media, you read in the papers, a lot of them say, well, people are reluctant to spend because they're feeling depressed, this and that. And they say what we have to do is, you know, if people feel more confident, then they'll spend more money. Well, People are depressed, and they have good cause to be. Um, you know, the economy is not good. But the reality is, actually, people are spending a lot, uh, and this is something you just have to look at the data. The savings rate is actually at historically low levels. Or if you want to flip it over, if you don't save, you consume. It's just definitional. So consumption as a share of GDP is actually at historic highs. It's not low; it's very high. So the idea, of, you know, we're just going to, you know, show some good movies and everyone will laugh and go out and spend lots of money. No. The reason people aren't spending more is a very simple reason. They don't have more money. Okay, it's the same reason homeless people don't spend. You know, they don't have the money. It's, it's not complicated. They don't have the money. So we're not going to see some big surge in consumption. So if we're saying, how are we going to fill this gap? You know, we're going to have people get happy and spend more. That doesn't make any sense. They're already spending as much as we should expect them to. That's not going to happen. Okay, okay, what about investment? We'd all like to see firms invest more. That would be great. Um, but they're not going to do it. If you look at the investment as a share of GDP, we're almost back to the pre-recession level. So again, we took a really big hit, the downturn. You know, a lot of firms obviously were put out the edge, put over in some cases. Um, but the reality is they have plenty of money now. Okay, they're not, you know, they're not putting off investment because they don't have the money. They're investing really about as much as we should expect them to invest. So the investment share of output, as I say, is almost back to the pre-recession level. And it's actually somewhat above the average if you look back over the last 40 years. So it isn't to say that we can't see somewhat more investment, but if you go, are we going to fill a gap of 5% of GDP, of $800 billion with more investment? No, that doesn't make any sense. You can't tell a serious story how you're going to do it that way. All right, that gets us to government spending. Okay, well, can we do it with government spending? Yeah, we could do it with government spending. And a lot of us have been out there, you know, we'd like to see more spending on infrastructure, more spending on education, get money to state and local governments so they could hire back some of the people they laid off in the last three or four years. We could do that, but it doesn't look very likely. I mean, that's a political decision. It doesn't look very likely. So we got, we got consumption. It's not going to happen. We have investment. Not going to happen. Government spending, again, could happen, but, you know, we don't see, you know, being serious people here, we're, we don't think that's very likely. Besides, I've got a different story. I'm happy to hear it, but I don't think that's very likely. So, what does that lead? That leads to the trade sector. Okay, and if we look at the trade sector right now, we have a deficit of roughly three percent of GDP, about five hundred billion a year. What does this mean? It's a fairly simple story. This is money people in the United States are earning, and they're spending it overseas. 
Okay, so that's money that creates demand elsewhere. They're spending it in Canada, in China, in Mexico, wherever it might be. Point is, it's not creating demand in the United States. That creates this big hole in demand. All right, well, that's not an insoluble problem. We didn't always have very large trade deficits. We've had trade deficits for most of the last three decades, but for the most part, they were actually relatively small. I'm saying this as someone who thought they were too large back, you know, 15 years ago. But the reality was, if you go back to the mid-90s, our trade deficit was around 1, 1.5% 1 GDP. When did it get very large? It got very large following the East Asian financial crisis. What happened was, as a result of that crisis, I won't go into great details here, but we can get the specifics if you want. Following that crisis, because of the terms that the IMF imposed on crisis, we had countries rushing to get dollars as reserves, I should say developing countries, so East Asian countries, certainly China's in that mix, Latin American countries, they all got dollars as reserves. That led to a huge rise in the value of the dollar and a huge increase in our trade deficit. So our trade deficit just spikes in the years following 1997. It goes from a bit over 1% GDP to it was about 4% by the end of that decade, the business cycle peaked in 2000. It peaked eventually at over 6% GDP, or now over almost 6% GDP in 2006. We've got it down a little, partly because of the downturn, partly because the dollar is falling, but we still have this trade deficit of 3% GDP. How do you get that down? Well, it's not a mystery. Get the dollar down. Now, there's other things people talk about, and I'm not saying there aren't other things we shouldn't do in terms of promoting our exports, industrial policy. There's lots of things that make a long, long list but nothing comes close to getting the value of the dollar down. And that is not the secret. The reason the dollar is high is we have a lot of countries that deliberately prop up the dollar against their currencies. People always talk about China. They're obviously the biggest one, but it's, there's a lot of others, particularly uh, South Korea, we can mention, other countries around the world that keep up the value of the dollar against their currency. We could get those countries to change their policy. You negotiate that. You know, it's not a question of beating them up, because, you know, I don't think we go to war with anyone, because I hope not. But you negotiate that, and it's a question of priorities and negotiations. I once heard Secretary Geithner, uh, Tim Geithner, who was Treasury Secretary, talk about this, and he said, well, we have lots of things we raise. We always talk about currency, but we have lots of things. Well, if you want these countries, in particular China, again, being the most important, if you want them to raise the value of their currency against the dollar, it can't be on a laundry list where we say we want increased access for Goldman Sachs, we want you to have more respect for Microsoft's copyrights, we want Pfizer's, you know, patents, blah, blah, blah. We have to say, we want you to raise the value of your currency. That's the first thing. We can talk about the other items, but that has to, that's not done. That's very clearly not done. That's a political choice. So in other words, if as a policy choice, as a political choice, we make getting the value of the dollar down against other currencies, we could do that. That would get our trade deficit down. That could get us the full employment. And just to make my last point, if we wanted to move towards a balanced budget or concerns with budget deficit, well, getting the trade deficit down, that will increase GDP. That will increase tax revenues, reduce payments for things like, you know, SNAP and unemployment benefits. I want people to get SNAP and unemployment benefits. I want them to work. You know, and that's the way to do it. Okay, so that, that is what should be talked about. And it's remarkable in this town. I, I always write about this and beat the press. The trade figures came out last week. Nothing in the New York Times. Tiny little piece in the digest section of the Post. Nothing at all about it. It was a higher number than expected to, so it should have gotten attention. Okay, other point I wanted to make uh, about the target, the 4% target. Uh, this is something people really have to keep their eyes on. And the reason why the target matters, we're not just saying, oh, what's our goal out there? What would we like to see? This is a matter of policy because the Federal Reserve Board is sitting there. It's not always easy for them to make the economy grow. You know, there's this debate. You know, is uh, we have zero interest rate now. We have the quantitative easing policy where the Fed's buying up long-term bonds, mortgage-backed securities. The question is how effective that is, and I think it's been somewhat effective. But that, that's a side point. Is how much can they boost the economy at this point? That's that, I'll say it's an open question. There's no doubt if they want to slow the economy, they could do that. I don't think anyone disputes that. So if the Federal Reserve Board decides, you know, we're at full employment, we have to raise interest rates in order to slow the economy so the unemployment rate doesn't doesn't fall further, doesn't create inflation, they can do that, and they will do that, you know, if they think we're at that point. So the big question is, what is that point? Now, back in the 1990s, I remember being laughed at by a lot of the best economists in D.C., because I thought the unemployment rate could get below 6%. You know, back then, it was absolute conventional wisdom, and I don't just mean, you know, the conservative people over at the American Enterprise Institute. I mean, you know, people at Brookings, people in the Clinton administration, liberal economists in Washington, D.C., it was absolute gospel that 6%, maybe they'd say 5A, you know, but basically 6% was as low as you could go. 
Well, we were very lucky. I, I ordinarily trash Alan Greenspan to the end of the earth, but the one thing I'll give him enormous credit for, we were very lucky he was at the Fed, and the one thing you can say about Greenspan is he is not a orthodox economist. So back in 1995-96, the unemployment rate was a little below 6%, and the orthodox economists who were clean appointees, people like Laura Tyson, not Laura Tyson, um, Jenny Yellen, um, who I'm glad to see at the Fed now, but people like Janet Yellen went to Alan Greenspan and said, you have to raise interest rates because the unemployment rate's going to fall too low and we're going to get inflation. And thankfully, Greenspan said, no, I don't see any inflation out there. And he didn't raise rates, and the unemployment rate fell to 55 fell to 5%, fell to 4.5%, and then as a year on average in 2000, it was at 4%. And again, this is way below what you know, all these economists thought was feasible. The inflation rate should have been rising. It didn't. It didn't. Minimal, minimal increase. You know, Jared and I have looked at the data very closely, and you know, you could find a tenth or two tenths. You know, it's not the sort of thing any serious person would say was a rise in inflation. In fact, at the end of the period, the point where the recession hit in 2001, the inflation rate was lower than it was back in 1995 when we first started to get these low unemployment rates. So if you want to make a case for accelerating inflation there, uh, you really have to look pretty hard. Um, there just is not much evidence for it. Well, the reason why this is so important, you know, and again, Jared will go into this in more detail, we saw good wage growth in that period. It was very important that the unemployment rate fell below 5%, fell to 4%. We saw good wage growth. Had we stopped at 6%, most workers would not have seen any benefit from the growth at the end of that decade. So that was tremendously important. And this is going to be very important in the economic debate going forward, because as I was saying, we have people today who are looking at the numbers, and you know, again, I think they're crazy. I mean, I think they don't have any basis for, that, for, for this claim. But they're saying, OK, we're getting close to full employment. And we all know the numbers. We're 6.7% in the last month's data. We're close to full employment. The Fed's going to have to start to slam on the brakes. So it's going to be really important that we're out there saying, no, you know, you can't, you can't start raising rates. You can't sort of declare the job done. We're very, very far from having recovered from the downturn. And in fact, you know, I think, well, I'm sure it will decide for himself whether he wants to agree with me. But I would say we weren't even at full employment before the downturn. I mean, it was still 4.5% unemployment. We were just starting to see some wage gains. We should have seen, we should have gone lower. We should have seen more wage gains. So, we're very, fair, very, very far from getting back to that point, and it's going to be very important that you know we continue to make the case, and, and we will, of course, that we're very far from full employment. There's no fear about runaway inflation. This is just nonsense. So I'll stop with that and let Jared pick it up. Jared, do I need to bring one of those closer? Uh, yeah. uh, I think we lean in as the phrase goes. Then can lean into. Um, so uh, before I start my comments, let me just respond to a couple of things uh, Dean said. Um, first of all, uh, the 6.7% unemployment rate right now, and Dean is absolutely right that, that, that the, those concerns you're starting to hear are, are out there, uh, erroneously so, I strongly agree. 6.7% is actually not the number you should see when you look at the unemployment rate. You should see something that's maybe a point above that. Because the unemployment rate, widely agreed upon, is biased down because a lot of folks have left the job market uh, due to uh, weak demand. Now, some folks have left the job market because they retired, so it's not all a demand side story, uh, but uh, at least part of it is. Uh, and when you're not in the, uh, in the labor force, you're not counted as unemployed. So really, the unemployment rate as a measure of slack is biased down considerably right now. Keep that in mind if you're starting to think, if you're someone who's starting to think that we're getting into uh, um, uh, some sort of pressured uh, zone. And Janet Yellen is well aware of that downward bias. <laughs> Secondly, I think there's an interesting question. I won't get into it now. That's something Dean and I should, should talk about. Um, the extent to which we were at full employment at the end of the last uh, uh, cycle in, uh, in, uh, before the Great Recession, because the unemployment rate did well, it was below 5% then, but the employment rate was still elevated. And um, you, but, but he, and, and so I would argue, I think I, I would agree with Dean that, that that didn't really look like a full employment economy. But even so, you could actually began to see some positive wage movements. So as you'll see in a second, those correlations are very strong today. Okay, now um, my official talk begins. Um, so I wanted to talk about the, uh, the benefit side of the equation. What uh, happens 
in, to, in, in very positive ways from the perspective of uh, folks here in this room in this building. And I should say, by the way, by way of introduction, that uh, I'm also uh, very pleased to be here. And, and thank you, Rich, for joining us. Um, to me, there's no question in my mind that the labor movement is the largest single movement in the country in support of the ideas that we're talking about. I mean, by far. And that's very big for, for us. So uh, before I get into some of the benefits of full employment, though, I have to talk a little bit about its absence and how pervasive that absence has been. The first slide here, uh, in, in many ways, is, is, is the only slide I think I need uh, in, in talking about uh, these issues because it uh, tells a very dramatic story. I don't know, three bars, so uh, no, I don't know. Uh, to me, it's dramatic. Um, uh, the, it, it, what, what you see here are the percent of quarters that unemployment was too high. And this is a little, little more gnarly than it looks. Um, any quarter of the uh, year, a three month period, any quarter of the year where the unemployment rate is above uh, the uh, CBO's estimate of the full employment unemployment rate, that's called the NERU, but don't worry about that. It's just the, the rate at which uh, inflation is supposedly stable. We happen to think that's been biased up, but put that aside. Any quarter where the unemployment rate is above full employment is registered as a quarter when unemployment is too high here. And from 49 to 79, uh, that situation occurred only a third of the time. Since then, it's occurred 70% of the time. Uh, uh, if you take out the Great Recession, which was, of course, a period of very deep labor slack and long, uh, still there, by the way, uh, it's still two-thirds of the time. So, um, and I don't, you know, analytically, it's not really a, an obvious reason why you take out the Great Recession. What I'm trying to tell you is, uh, since 1980, 70% uh, of, the, of the time, the unemployment rate has been too high. We've been uh, um, above uh, uh, the uh, full employment rate. Uh, our job market has been slack. That explains a lot, okay? Uh, if you look at the trends in inequality, uh, you'll find that in, the, in that, the period when that first bar was active, in the, in the uh, post-war, uh, post-World War II period up to the, up to the mid, late 1970s, incomes grew together at the bottom and the middle and the top. They just tracked each other. They all just about doubled from the mid 40s to the mid 70s. Uh, then uh, incomes diverge like crazy, and now we have this inequality story we're all well versed in. Now, I'm not saying that the only factor driving inequality is slack job markets, but I'm telling you it's a big factor, and I'll show you a little bit uh, more about that in a second. So I think a fair question at this point is why? Why is that second bar more than twice uh, as, as large as that first bar? I'm going to tick off a number of reasons, but I'm not going to go into them in the interest of time. Happy to explore any of them uh, further in Q&A. Um, well, you already heard about the trade imbalance. There was much more, not just a, there was much more trade in the latter period, and I actually think that's a good thing. The bad thing is that there was much more imbalanced trade, you heard that from Dean. Uh, particularly in the most recent, say, 10 years or so, there was much more finance. Uh, a much larger share of the economy's output came out of the financial sector, and, and, and that sector to me uh, looks like uh, it's associated with um, uh, uh, less stable uh, economic growth, more bubbles and busts, and um, uh, less, kind of a, a less of the kind of bona fide productivity and job growth that uh, I'd like to see. So uh, more imbalanced trade, more financialization, less collective bargaining, uh, but, uh, I think uh, something I don't have to go into too deeply here. Uh, technological change is often raised as one reason. I have a question mark there because I'm not nearly as convinced as the, the average economist that, that technology is driving this trend as much as the things I've said so far, but we can, we can get into that later if you like. Uh, very important, in many ways, bad macroeconomic management. I think Dean gave a great example of very good macroeconomic management uh, by the Fed uh, in the latter 90s, but that's just part of this period. And were it not for that, that second bar would be even higher. Both on the fiscal and the monetary side, and the fiscal side is focused on uh, budgeting, uh, on, on, on balancing budgets and eradicating deficits uh, at a time when, in fact, the economy needs uh, fiscal uh, tailwinds. It's been getting fiscal headwinds. Now, I should be clear, I'm an employee of the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. I, I, I believe there is such a thing as fiscal recklessness, and there's a time when you actually uh, very much want your, want your budget deficit, debt-to-GDP ratio, to be coming down. 
that time is not when your private uh, sector economy is still suffering from all this slack. That's when you're at full employment. And in fact, as we point out in the book in a, in a section, I think it's pretty important and underappreciated, more so than tax changes and the policy changes that we all get wound up around here, full employment itself is associated with much, uh, with, with, with much better fiscal outcomes. So uh, bad macro management. And finally, um, this is somewhat philosophical, but I think it's really important, uh, a, a kind of allegiance to market outcomes in a way that's prevailed in that second period more so than that former period. The idea that um, left to its own, and this, by the way, was very much associated with the Greens many years, the idea that left to its own devices, markets will self-correct and will perfectly equilibrate. Uh, Dean and I gave this talk the other day, and there was a conservative economist who was there to comment on our book, and his thing was um, basically, you know, your book is a real head scratcher. Uh, I don't understand it because we know the economy just settles into an equilibrium full employment. And ergo, why do you need to write a book about this? And yeah, it, it's, it's kind of a chuckle. Uh, but, um, you, you know, kind of laugh to keep from crying chuckle. Um, so this allegiance to market, market outcomes has led to something that I call the shampoo economy. And it's very uh, much represented in, in this, this graph. The shampoo economy is bubble, bust, or heat. Uh, and, 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 and I think when you uh, assume that um, markets self-correct, when you assume that financial markets left to their own devices will um, equilibrate and yada yada, it, you, you end up with this kind of uh, shampoo cycle. Okay. Uh, the uh, turning to what happens when you are either at full employment or not at full employment? Uh, in some ways, the, one of the core cha I'd say one of the core chapters of our book um, is a statistical analysis. And by the way, pretty straightforward. I mean, in part because I don't do the high-powered econometrics I used to, and, uh, which is probably a good thing. Um, uh, but you know, nobody's in, in a way to be transparent. I mean, these are these are pretty simple correlations, um, and I think that's that's useful. Um, this is a slide of some unfortunate things that happen when unemployment is, um, is above uh, the full employment level. So when the job market is too slack, uh, the first three bars show a pattern that uh, will become familiar to you as we go through these slides. The benefits of low unemployment, the costs of high unemployment, um, redound most severely uh, to those in the bottom uh, they uh, affect those in the middle, and they have kind of pretty little to do with those at the top. Um, the income of families at the 20th percentile falls a couple of percent when the unemployment rate is a point above, uh, uh, when, when they're for each point of slack there is in, in the job market. Uh, for the median uh, uh, family, one, 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 one and a half points or so, and less than a percentage point for the 95th percentile. For African American families, the median income uh, falls 2% when the uh, unemployment uh, uh, rate is a point uh, uh, too slack. Um, and you see for white families, it's, it's less. Um, it, uh, when unemployment is uh, too high, it's inequality inducing. That is the ratio of the 95th percentile to the 25th percentile, where the ratio of high to low incomes uh, grows 1.6%. Uh, uh, um, if you flip this over the other way, um, this, in fact, is one of our, one of our key charts, I'd say. The first chart and this chart, if I had to just choose two from the book, these would probably be them. Um, the first chart shows the absence of full employment in, in recent years. This chart um, was, was one that uh, we, 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 we created. In order to get a lot of observations, we made a big database to do, this, uh, to do this book that looked at all the states over something like 30 years. And, uh, and so we had a lot, a lot of observations, you know, 50 states over 30 years, uh, so like 1,500 observations. And that enabled us to look at the impact on wages at different levels of, uh, of unemployment, in this case, uh, um, uh, of uh, a full employment job markets. So when, when, the labor, when, the labor force, uh, when the labor market is tight and employers have to bid wages up to get and keep the workers they need, the benefits are strongest to workers at the bottom, uh, they're uh, medium strength for workers in the middle, and they uh, do nothing for workers at the top. Well, the workers, and by the way, this is the hourly wage. So the hourly wage for a, uh, what the numbers mean is that if unemployment falls 10%, not 10 percentage points, but 10%, so like um, 5% to 4.5%, the unemployment rate falls 10%, uh, the wage of the 20th percentile worker goes up 10%. 
and about 5% at the 50th and 0 at the 90th, the hourly wage. Now, here's what I want you to think about. If you think about the inequality problem, it looks the opposite of this graph. Wages are getting whacked most at the bottom, getting whacked uh, uh, in the middle, uh, not as badly, and then doing great at the top. This shows you that full employment is a great antidote to the inequality problem. Now, what's really important here is not just the hourly wage. It's also the amount of worker hours that are available to you. And without going into detail, and just so I can watch down my talk and have time for your questions, Without going into detail, what this shows is that it's not just hourly wages that uh, um, uh, grow for those at the bottom and the middle in full employment economies. It's their annual hours of work. And that means they're getting, they're getting more work at higher wages. Uh, that means that their income rise. And what, 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 uh, what Rich said in the introduction should not be forgotten in this regard. Full employment is not just a benefit for the unemployed, for the underemployed. It's a very important benefit for, for incumbent workers, for workers who are already at the job, because they can get higher wages and more hours if that's what they see. Um, so, all that said, I suspect uh, there are not too many people in here who uh, disagree with many of these contentions, although we obviously are happy, happy to hear that. Um, but uh, you want to say, okay, great, you know, we're, we're convinced we should have a lower trade deficit and more full employment. Uh, how do we get there? Uh, as Rich said, we are very far indeed from full employment, especially when you factor in the bias I mentioned due to the labor force decline. Uh, we, we, we spend more time in this book than our last book on full employment thinking about that question. And we articulated a number of paths to get back to full employment. And I'm going to tick them off again without explanation. I'm happy to explore in the discussion. Um, better fiscal and monetary policy. I could explain what that means. I've actually been fond of the Fed uh, and think they've been a, an aggressive actor uh, in, this, in this space uh, over the Great Recession, although uh, I, I would argue they are in danger of tightening too soon. Um, you've heard about a lower trade deficit. Subsidized employment, I think, is very important, and uh, uh, particularly as it affects uh, lower uh, uh, wage, long-term unemployed workers, minority workers. During the Recovery Act, when I worked for the administration, the TANF uh, emergency fund subsidized job was a real learning moment for me. I thought it was a great program, and I think it should be scaled up. Uh, work sharing, uh, which is one way to not necessarily create more labor demand, but a better way to spread out uh, some of the demand deficits that exist, and uh, uh, Dean can speak to that. Apprenticeships and on-the-job training, where there's, I think, a good uh, connection between, uh, between trade unionism, by the way. Um, investment in infrastructure. I'd say investment in public goods, including infrastructure, public good infrastructure, but also in human capital. Uh, that's uh, another important path. Okay, finally, my last point. I wanted to just let you know about a project that I'm working on. It's supported by the Rockefeller, Rockefeller Foundation, which I think is a very, a very good thing. Because it's always getting supported by some foundation. You think it's a good thing, but I think it's a good thing. Um, on, on, this, uh, on, the, uh, on this idea of, of charting a path back to full employment. And uh, as part of this project, I've been able to commission seven papers, one by this wacko named Dean Baker. Uh, I've been able to commission seven papers from uh, Tony economists on ideas to get back to full employment. So this is a very live wire, in my view. Uh, and it's up to us to keep it that way. Thank you. Uh, I ask people uh, when they ask a the question to make a question. Uh, in uh, a lecture uh, on things that in the past we've had a little problem with that, so I'd ask you to be as concise as you can. Uh, let me start off by saying uh, uh, you said we saw some uh, wage movement at the end of the last cycle. Where at on the spectrum? What quartiles were we beginning to see that? Um, well, I guess what I noticed was uh, the, uh, the, 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 middle, the, the middle and the bottom median and say the 20th percentile, um, started to pick up a bit toward the very end. Um, and uh, I'm talking about two, let me see, I'm talking about like 2007, maybe 2006. So not long enough to repair the damage by a long shot, but I did see the curve begin to turn uh, from, uh, in, in the bottom half. Yeah, exactly. Uh, questions? Yeah. You haven't really talked about government policies that are being 
increasing the export of jobs and profit overseas, so the companies won't invest in the United States. You know, if you get a of taxation or some of the other proposals, why aren't you focusing on productive policies that seem to be so important to investment in the United States? And, I, I think those are important, but I think far and away the dollar swamps that. I mean, if you got the dollar down by 20%, that, that would have the same impact as putting a 20% tariff on all our imports and 20% subsidy on all our exports. So it's not to say we shouldn't try to make the tax. I mean, the tax system sounds crazy. I just, there's an article in the paper, Ireland had a big fall in its GDP in the fourth quarter. When you read through it, the reason why it had a big fall in GDP in the fourth quarter was because a big drug, it was from Pfizer, went off patent and they were booking the profits in Ireland. You know, so, so it had nothing to do with Ireland as a company. David K. Johnson just came out with a paper saying that the $7.3 trillion of offshore profits hidden should be taxed or used in the United States by American multinationals. I mean, that's a significant sum of money. Yeah, well, the tax on it would be a significant sum, but, you know, again, I'm saying that's not going to affect the trade that much. You know, I'm happy to, we should be taxing, so I'm not saying we should, I'm just saying that's not going to affect the trade flows for the most part. Very often, the, as I say, in the case of Ireland, nothing's going on in Ireland except the post office, you know, so it's not as though the jobs are left, it's a, they, they're just declaring the problem. Well, Irish people like the issue. Yeah, okay, so there is a guess, but, you know. Anybody else? Yes. I was calling the NALC. I um, just wanted to, what are your you know, ideas about why the government or why the industry is not pursuing things in a strong way over here recommending? It seems pretty well, straightforward. Well, if the question's on trade, I think it's, you know, you do have very clear conflicting interests. That, you know, they are representing the administration. So, you know, when they sit down with China, you know, there's two sort of things going on here. I'm thinking China's obviously the biggest. But, there are two things going on. One is groups that have directly opposed interest. So Walmart's spent a lot of effort getting low-cost supply chains. And that means getting cheap goods from China and Bangladesh. They don't want to see the dollar fall, because that, that undermines their efforts. And General Electric's done out manufacturing and you know, holding them up. But there are many, many others. So those are directly affected. The other is that, you know, as, as Timothy Gardner said, we have lots of issues with various in China. So if we say, OK, we want to give you something like currency, well, they're not going to go, OK, what else do you want us to do? They're going to go, okay, well, then we're not going to give you what you asked for on giving Goldman Sachs access, and we're not going to do what you wanted on Pfizer's patents. You know, there's going to be a trade-off there. So Pfizer and Goldman Sachs and the other groups, all of whom have considerable power and influence, they're going to say, we don't give a little currency. Get us access. Get our copyrights protected. So I think that's what's going on. I want to speak to this also um, and, and bring in a little bit of the first question. Um, so I'm going to give the administration some credit in some areas that uh, go, go, go a bit the other way uh, than the question uh, suggested. Um, while I, and by the way, this is not about trade. Because I think on trade, I think Dean has a strong point. Even when I was with the administration, I thought the idea that we were targeting exports was okay, but you have to target net exports. Just targeting exports doesn't, doesn't do this enough work. But on, on a lot of other issues, I actually think there's more um, going on, uh, more positive stuff going on than, than you might recognize. First of all, the administration very much jumped into the Keynesian stimulus business back in the, in the day, and it didn't last long enough, uh, but uh, that sensibility was very strong, I, I, I can tell you that for a fact. Um, and if you kind of think of the things that I was ticking through a minute ago, um, investment in public infrastructure, both in the, on the physical and human capital side, are uh, uh, very high agenda items uh, for the administration, remain so to this day. Uh, clearly, political gridlock's uh, a, a huge issue. The administration has consistently opposed, and I, 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 it's harder to do this than it should be, and, and so I give them credit, Terry Olton, a movement to territoriality. Uh, everybody thinks territoriality is the only way to go for uh, international taxation outside of here. And the administration not only has opposed that, uh, but um, in their white paper, um, they explicitly say um, they'd rather do a minimum tax as opposed to a territorial tax and keep the worldwide taxation of corporate uh, multinationals in place. They've also opposed this repatriation idea, which is, I think, uh, also a, uh, a very problematic way to deal with the problem. Yeah. Question? Yes. Uh, Dr. Gardner, uh, something a little confused about, about timing. Supposing you're able to drive the relative value of the dollar down. So the immediate impact is all of the imports are much more expensive for Americans. 
Okay, so ultimately, some production of goods comes back to the U.S. But with modern technology, it will be much less labor intensive than what had been there before. So how long would these effects take to be really positive? I have a graph that I have in the book that shows with about a two-year lag, um, you get, well, I would say you get the full effect. I mean, most of the effects built within two years. So you're right, the immediate effect. So let's say, you know, snap our figures, fingers, we got the dollar down by 20% against the currencies of our trading partners. The original impact is the price of these goods are going to rise while we import. So, you know, all of us are paying a little more out of our pocket. But gradually, we'll see production shift. You know, producers here will ramp up. And as I say, in about two years, you'll see, you know, most of the effect, you know, and again, it's not going to be completely reversed. That's someone saying also we can completely reverse everything. No, some of this, you know, we, we move production overseas, and as a result of that, that same production is not going to come back. We might get some other production, but, you know, there are lasting impacts, which is why it was such a bad idea to let the dollar get so overvalued to begin with. I would just add that the assumption embedded in your question about technological advance, labor-saving technology and manufacturing, uh, may be um, a bit too broad. Uh, one of the papers that's being written for uh, this project I mentioned, and I don't want to uh, uh, lean too far into it before it's, it's out, but um, she's written other papers in this period. Sue Hausman, a great economist from the Upshot Institute for, our for us. And she looks at this uh, issue of manufacturing productivity, which has grown uh, a great deal, supporting the, uh, uh, I think, supporting the contention that uh, there's a lot of labor-saving technology going on in there, um, because, you know, employment's been down, productivity's down. Well, if you actually take computer production, which has some measurement issues, out of the uh, manufacturing productivity statistics, there's not nearly the productivity boom that you see. And in fact, in the manufacturing supply chain, there's still, I mean, there's some more technology, but there's still um, uh, lots of jobs that I think we could uh, we could add there. So um, before we convince ourselves that our um, manufacturing strategy will won't help much on the job side because of tech, uh, technological change and robotics and all that, um, you should definitely uh, look at the issues that have been raised. Institute Women's Policy. Uh, um, I heard a New York Times reporter say a couple of days ago that one of our problems is that on our side, on the liberal or progressive side, we are not putting out enough messages about how important uh, what the Fed is doing is, that we should be talking more and more <coughs> about maintaining the expansionist policies because the other side is always talking against it. And that that's part of what you know. Part of what happens in the airways is what affects them. And that you know, whenever anyone goes and gives a talk on what we can do for full employment, the Fed policy, as it was in your case, should always be on that list. So I just thought, you thought that was true, and if there was something that we could do, you know, to elevate consciousness about that throughout our groups. Yeah, that's a really good question. And, you know, it's one of these things, well, we're in the same boat, you know, they're always like, you're doing this, and then suddenly you get an attack over on this other side that, you know, the Fed had been pretty good. You know, Bernanke had, you know, pushed the rates to zero, and you compare the Fed to the European Central Bank, even you know, any central bank except maybe Japan Central Bank at this point, um, you know, they were the best, you know, in terms of, you know, promoting expansionary policy. And, you know, I'll just speak for myself. I started thought, oh, good, you know, we got Jenny Yellow there, who's, you know, the best person we've had there since the New Deal, you know. So, so okay, we got a good person there. She's made it very clear she wants to keep her foot on the accelerator and, you know, let the unemployment rate fall a long time before we start worrying about inflation. But, you know, two things. One, she's getting yelled at by everyone else. She has to respond. She can't just act in isolation. The other thing, just purely practical matter, open market means 12 votes. You know, so it's great to have the chair on your side but she alone can't pull it along. So absolutely, we're gonna to have to, you know, and it was news to me, you know, Jared and I both saw the same thing, you know, we had these people who were just thinking about this guy having solstice, so it wasn't necessarily that prominent or anything, but the point is he's pretty much a centrist, I don't you know, I don't know him that well, but you know, he's not a right winger, he's not a heritage guy or an AI guy or anything. They said, well, we're really close to full employment. So, so we have to be yelling there. So that's absolutely right. And that's one of the things back in the 90s, I think we did that with some effect. We, you know, we had a lot of things. We had, the, you know, the, the AFL-CIO was very visible on this, and we brought some business groups along. I remember after being some things with Larry Kudlow, and he'd get up there and go, what's wrong with people having jobs? I, you know, Kudlow's all over the place, but for whatever reason, he was fine with having the unemployment rate fall. So, um, you know, the point was to create some space for the Fed to, you know, keep its foot on the accelerator. And that is going to be very important because, again, we can debate 
how effective the quantitative easing has been. Again, I think it's been helpful. I don't think it's hugely helpful, but I think it's been positive. But there's no doubt in my mind, if they start raising rates, that will slow the economy. Well, I think, uh, well, I, I, I agree with that, and I, I agree, Heidi, with uh, what is, I think, explicit in your question. Yeah, we should be doing more of that. Um, I think it matters a lot who's on the uh, Federal Open Market Committee. And I guess there were just uh, three or two new appointees, uh, with one, one um, person who's going to be reappointed uh, in the news yesterday and today. Uh, but there's still an open chair. <laughs> and uh, it would be smart to uh, think about a real full employment uh, person in, in that chair. Um, I, uh, I will also say. Uh, Where do those numbers come from? They all have to come from the bank presidencies or the Fed? No, these are the ones that the, the open share is one that the president holds. So, so that can be any person? Yeah. 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 What about Dean or Jack? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Travis. 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 Um, and then both CIOs that start working on this. And then, fine, and, and then um, you know, I don't, I think there's a real, uh, one way to get at this is the Fed very much, and for very good reasons, and I've told this story, it re really, really likes to, it really views themselves as outside of the political system. And it's one of the reasons why they were able to be so uh, 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 aggressive in monetary stimulus in the Great Recession when people were beaten up. Didn't, didn't Rick Perry say, we're going to kick your ass when you go to Texas to Bernanke? Um, so, you know, they need to, they need to be insulated. Um, I think it'd be, related to this, what your comment made me think of, I think it'd be really great if people running for office office in particular, thought about full employment as a key part of their of their planning. I mean, uh, when we when I've trotted this out in places where people are less familiar with this kind of discussion, they both been like, yeah, of course, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> but let me just say one very specific thing that we should be talking about and thinking about. You know, the Republicans all the time, you know, uh, Janet Yellen is testifying in the House and Senate, and they're yelling at her, you're debasing the currency, you know, inflation's about our people should be armed with questions on the other side. You know, the unemployment rate is still so high. You know, what could the Fed do? This and that. So she, you know, she's got these people out there, not necessarily criticizing you. The point is, you know, we're out there. We want you to put keep the foot on the accelerator. That has to be as visible as possible. Maybe we could. Um, maybe we could get some people who support to write Yes. Thank you both. I can't use it the Wilson Center. As a veteran of the Joint Economic Committee, that used to be our whole focus was full employment, but somehow that's faded. Dean, I wanted one question for you. That I thought you did a great job of pointing to the conflicting economic interests on USTR and our trade negotiators. But what about the calls from the State Department? Hold off. We need China on North Korea, but we need China helping with Iran. How do we deal with that? How do we respond to that pressure? Well, you know, I can't answer all the diplomatic issues, but again, we have a long list of economic issues, and, you know, I can't believe there aren't economic trade-offs we can make. You know, so again, I know I've heard this said, it's very open, we want them to open their financial markets. Well, I don't give a damn, you know, for most of us here that, you know, unless we have a lot of stock in Citigroup, and I doubt many people at the table here do, we don't care, you know, it's not something that's really going to help the, the nation, it helps the people, you know, and I suppose executives in Citigroup. But, you know, there, there are a lot of financial things that we're pushing them on, or economic issues we're pushing on. It seems we can make trade-offs there, you know, so I'm not going to say, it's, you know, what well, we're asking North Korea worth this or that. I think there's enough trade-offs on the economic side we should be able to get. Because I also should point out, you know, it's a state of policy in China. They want to focus more on domestic demand, which presumably means that they anticipate themselves raising the value of their currency. It's just they might have a little different timeline than we do. So maybe their targets, I don't know, five years, or our target might be, you know, we want two years, you know. Let me add one sentence. Um, when we're talking about this problem on um, currency management, it's not just China. It's just a very important issue. There's uh, well over a dozen countries who uh, are, are, are playing this game. Yeah, that's a very good point. China's obviously the most visible and biggest, but there are many others. Yeah. I'd like to go back to manufacturing a little bit. Dean, you said that you can see a two year lag, you got the dollar straightened out. Uh, so I watch this stuff pretty closely, and so I wouldn't expect electronics, apparel, textiles to come back. Not expecting General Motors to start, you know, making more engines here, less in, in, in Mexico. So, I'm sort of wondering, like, how does the thesis play out? 
And does it play out in us getting, you know, more future growth, say like clean energy stuff, windmills and solar panels? And if that's so, how important are the other policies that the Obama administration sort of put forward around, you know, industrial policy type stuff? Well, I'd say it would be a mix. You know, we would get some more new to, in, new industries. Part of the story is we're still having industries going over, so that basically stops or at least slows sharply. Um, but, you know, one of the things you could look at, you know, and you're probably more familiar with the data than I am, but, you know, we did actually have a sharp fall in trade deficit. So it had been 6% of GDP, now we're looking at 3% of GDP, and I think, you know, most of that explanation, I'm not going to say all of it, most of that explanation was the decline in the dollar. So, Someone was asking me, and I, you know, again, I didn't know offhand, just look at, you know, the industries where we've improved our trade balance and assume that will be what continues. But again, it's not going to be exactly that, but that would be a good starting point. So if we look at where we've improved our trade balance from 06 to the present, you know, basically assume that will continue. How the tax energy, that's maybe a good picture. I, I did look at tax energy. It's still a very large improvement. You know, so the energy story, you know, of course, because we're importing some of less oil and we not much exports yet to speak of. Some export, but not too much yet. But uh, yeah, we're still importing less oil. But still, there's a, there's a large improvement. Our, our key graph is non energy trade deficit. So we've got to pull that out. Yeah, I'm going to switch to a microeconomic question. Could you comment on the uh, president's proposal to narrow the white collar exemption? Absolutely. Um, I've been, uh, that's something that Ross Eisenberg and I have uh, been working on uh, for a while, among others, uh, and uh, I just think it's a really good idea. <laughs> um, and uh, the idea is that um, this is actually, I, I, we first started working on this back in 2004 when the Bush administration made a set of changes that went the other way. They did raise this threshold, which I'll speak about in a second. But it, it looked to us like they were changing the eligibility criteria so that uh, too many people become exempt from overtime rules based on the duties at work, even though they look nothing like the kind of professionals, executives, supervisory workers that the FLSA, the Fair Labor Standards Act, intended to be exempted because they're not really on the clock kinds of workers. But if you're an assistant manager at a retail place or an, an orderly or an accountant and, you know, 90% uh, of your week you're doing uh, uh, work that looks a lot like the type of work that should be covered by overtime and then for a few hours you're telling other people what to do, uh, the changes that were made back then enable your employer to label you as a supervisor and thus exempt from overtime protection. Plus the threshold is way too low. The threshold, the salary threshold, right now is 455 uh, bucks a week or around 23, 24,000 a year. That's the bottom line for a family of four. And to be clear, that's the threshold below which if your salary is below that threshold, and you're a salary worker, you're not an hourly worker, you get OT. But if you're a salary worker, you're below that threshold, you automatically get it. But if the threshold's too low, it's, it's exempting too many people who ought to, in the spirit of the law, be covered by, by overtime. And by the way, this is another good example of the administration doing something that's important uh, by proposing to raise that threshold. I was telling Rich before we started, by the way, just because the president's announced the rule uh, doesn't mean we're out of the woods here because it matters a lot where that threshold gets set. Um, I have a piece in the New York Times today on the economics block on this, which, and it, which has a graph which I, I hope is, is useful in this regard, because it shows the historical thresholds and real values. Historically, the average threshold before this latest low ball was around $1,000 a week. Even that, if you do the math, I think I'm doing it right, is about $52,000 a year. Um, <laughs> it's about as good as I can do in my head. Um, and, uh, and that's, that, that's, that should sound to most people like the kind of salary that ought to be covered by, by overtime. So we need to uh, make sure that during the comment period, the pressure is on to make sure that threshold is high enough to really uh, protect uh, workers who ought to be getting this, uh, this uh, overtime protection. You look puzzled. Did I leave something important out? Oh, I was impressed. I'll go over to the New York Times. Yeah, read, read, read the block. <laughs> Can you explain a little bit more on the impact of the trade deficit with unemployment? Um, like you said, just a couple weeks ago, um, they announced the annual trade deficit the last year, and it was close to $500 billion. And it didn't make any major news. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> no, it, it is kind of funny because this is kind of straight economics. I've had arguments with reporters on this, and they're sort of like, where do you get into this? It's intro econ. I remember I was once arguing with a reporter who, someone I actually have a lot of respect for, a good reporter, and just going through the arithmetic and, and he's saying it's just an accounting identity. And going through, and he goes, you know, I don't like accounting identities. <laughs> <laughs> accounting identities. The point about accounting identities, by definition, it's true. It's not like, you know, it, it's just true. It's five know. equal five. I mean, yeah, you know, so, so two plus three equals five. It's, you know, it's got to be true. Two plus three will always be equal five. So, okay, so, yeah. so the story of the trade deficit is this, is this is income generated here that isn't creating demand here. So it's the same thing as, you know, we're just suck 500 billion out of the economy. So if we snap our fingers, no trade deficit, 500 billion spent here, well, that's creating as much jobs. You know, the face of it is 500 billion. You know, if everyone just went out and spent 500 billion more dollars, or you know, firms decide to invest 500 billion. I mean, there'll be differences because if they're investing, presumably, increased productivity. There'll be other things, second round effect. But in terms of the immediate impact, it's the same thing as if we just got a big boost in demand, 500 billion dollars. And you know, as I say, this is this is an accounting identity. It's it's money. It's demand that's going out of the economy. So. You have to make that up. If we want to maintain full employment, we have to make that up. So we can make it up, you know, it's going through the different sectors. We can make it up with the big government deficit, but no one wants to do that, you know, or at least the people in power don't want to do it. So it's not going to happen. Um, we made it up in the late 90s, the stock bubble. So because of the stock bubble, we had some of an investment boom, a lot of dot com nonsense, but it created demand. And then on top of that, people were spending based on their stock wealth. We made it up in the last decade with housing bubble. You know, some people are building a lot of homes, and all these people had equity in their homes, so a lot of people went out and borrowed based on their equity in their home or spent based on their equity. Again, not a good way to do it, because, you know, bubbles burst. Um, but basically, it creates a big gap in demand that you have to make up somewhere else. And again, there aren't plausible candidates. That's why I was arguing with this, the, this reporter. He's going, where do you want to make it up? And he's, you know, they're like convinced you can make it up somewhere. And I just go, okay, we don't have a lot of choices here. You know, where, where are you going to make it up? And, there isn't a plausible story. Let me add a couple of comments to that quickly. Um, whenever I write something and post it either on my blog or in, in some more visible place, I get a ton, uh, I, I get a lot of, uh, hate's too strong a word, a lot of disagreement from people who disagree with me. Who <coughs> oftentimes kind of institutionally disagree with me. So like just last night I was debating this overtime issue on the news hour with a guy from the NFIB. There's lobbies who stand on the other side of this stuff. Well, Dean and I had a piece in the Times, an op-ed, I don't know if your experience was the same, we had an op-ed in the Times called, uh, about three or four months ago, saying, you know, basically what Dean was talking about today, we're targeting the wrong deficit. We're targeting the budget deficit, if you want to target the trade deficit. Um, nobody really said anything. I mean, they just don't really know what to say about this, because the arithmetic is what it is. It's, it's, it's what, what, and, and I think it's important the way, at least I, for me, it's important the way you frame it, the way I frame it. It's not, this is not a protectionist idea. If anything, this is a free trade idea. Because what we're saying is currencies ought to be set in markets. And if someone is manipulating their currency so they can get uh, a, a, a larger uh, share of, of, uh, of exports and make, make, make our imports to them more expensive, that's, that's an antithetical to uh, a market approach here. So in this sense, I, you know, I, I always like to try to, when, when I can, I mean, maybe it's opportunistic, but in this case I think it's substantive as well, when I can, I like to be sort of a traditional economist. And no one's talking about, uh, about protectionism here. What we're talking about is really a level playing field. One last question, then you can come up while you're buying your books and everything inside. <laughs> I mean, isn't there an invisible cost in eliminating the trade deficit? In the sense that uh, if we don't import from China, we produce things much cheaply, much more cheaply. When I go to Walmart, aren't my prices going to be higher? Isn't the employee's prices going to be higher? Does that enter into your calculations? Yeah, there, there will be some increase in costs, and that's, of course, part of the story. So, you know, part of the story is that when imported price, the price of imported goods rises, we'll, we'll shift to more domestically produced goods. Now, we've seen that, because again, you know, as I say, we've got maybe half the way there in the sense that the dollar is falling. Most of the increase in the dollar following 97 is going away, where it's going to have to fall further to sort of make up this history. But, you know, that had very modest impact on prices. Um, you know, again, if you look at the rates of inflation over this period, they've been very low, which doesn't mean that nothing's increased in price. I'm sure if, you know, we went down to Walmart and we looked at the goods that were from China, they probably have gone up some price. Um, you know, so that, that is going to be part of the story. But in terms of, you know, most people, how most people are net 
customers are, are affected by this, I think certainly the vast majority of people we care about, people at the middle and bottom, they're going to be hugely benefited because, you know, okay, so they'll pay a little bit more when they go to Walmart, but they're more likely to have a job, and when they have that job, they're going to get a higher pay. So yeah. they're going to come out way ahead. I mean, the only thing I'd add is exactly where Dean stopped. One of the issues you get, and I should say that to the extent that there was any pushback, I said there was very little pushback from our op-ed. It was, it was in the spirit of your question. It's a good question. But one of the problems that a lot of economists have when they talk about trade is that they think that people are only consumers. But people are consumers, they're also workers. They're working age. And the resonance of this issue is often tapping the part of people who have been really hurt in the workforce for, for, for 20 or 30 years. Now, you could argue they've been helped at the Walmart, and to some extent they have. But They've been hurt more in the workforce. They've been helped in the Walmart. And I, I think this is a path to help them in, in both ways. Uh, I'm going to call it off right now. And uh, if you have additional questions, uh, Dean and Jerry will be out here for a while. We'll also be uh, just so you can talk to them there. I encourage you to pursue your line of questions. But more importantly, I encourage you to buy the book. And then after you've read it, if you have questions, then give them. It's only five bucks. Thanks a great Christmas. Yeah. <laughs>